people as part of the mix. And so what comes along with that is the leadership qualities people have to imbibe and really enhance, to really enhance the, the communication that takes place. And so throughout today's session, starting here at the Leadership Toolkit track, starting with innovation in the agency, then moving into Fear Factor, and then afterwards a phenomenal game setup. We're really going to be looking to drive three things today. How do you continue to develop trust in your organizations? As things become more interconnected, as things become more digi digitalized and automated, the trust factor from the IT side, from the personnel side, will continue to become more and more important. Additionally, how does that then drive productivity? You know, we all manage teams, we all have responsibilities to make sure that at the end of the day the requirements get fulfilled and we uh, address the mission successfully. So then how do you continue to encourage that as management methodologies change, things like that. And then the last part of the, the circle, really, from my perspective, how do you continue to develop new leaders to follow in your footsteps who really embody the principles that we're talking about today and moving forward in a very agile, forward-thinking, futurist state of mind? So that's the overarching themes for the tracks. Uh, the Fear Factor track after this is a very interesting take using the branding from Fear Factor. Really focus on putting yourself in other people's shoes and learning how to think differently outside the box and what motivates people from the, uh, from the bottom up. So on that note, I'd like to introduce our, our lead facilitator for Dave. He really needs no introduction. Sonny Hashmi, please. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. it. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here, guys. Um, I'm just a guy who's going <laughs> to ask some questions, so I don't, you don't need to talk for me. I actually have two awesome, awesome partners and speakers here, which are going to be far more interesting than anything I can ever say. I want to first <laughs> introduce Mr. Cooper. Steve Cooper is CIO of the Department of Commerce. He has tremendous, tremendous experience in many organizations. Uh, and if anybody in this room does not know Mr. Cooper, I think you're in the wrong track. Thank you. So Thank you so much for being here, sir. Please, uh, you know, well, we can stand or we can come and keep I, it I agile. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Can you get, is this on now? Um, I'm going to stand only because um, I came back from San Francisco on the little federal CIO council trip um, last night, uh, late last night. So and you're then, still sitting from that And trip. then <laughs> sat all through that and then driving here this morning and everything. I'm going to stand for a little while so I can get my body moving again. That's wonderful. And I also want to introduce Mr. Richard Spires. Um, again, if you don't know who Mr. Richard Spires is, <laughs> just go find a different track. Good to see you, sir. How nice you? to see you, Sonny. Uh, Mr. Spires, the former CIO of DHS, and has done amazing things uh, ever since. Uh, thought leader in the world of cybersecurity, in compliance, as well as innovation. I had the honor of uh, working with uh, Mr. Spires on the CIO Council when I was the CIO of GSA and always been a great mentor and a, and a thought leader. So what I figured today, um, and, and thanks again for, uh, to, uh, to Jake for organizing the session. It's going to be an awesome track. And what we want to do is to start out with some thoughts. And then I really hope that this is interactive. So if you guys are just sort of here to kind of listen, I'm so sorry again, you're in the wrong track. <laughs> you guys need to get closer and you need to get your energy up. We're going to have a conversation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to sort of pose some questions for us to ponder. They're not like question answers panel type questions, but really it's about getting your guys' perspective. You all, you represent different organizations, different companies, different, uh, different government uh, agencies, and different roles. So we'd love to hear from you, and then we'd love to hear from leaders here to think about, to, to, to try to sort of un, un, untether some of these themes. And we've heard these before, right? So um, we heard the great keynote this morning. I hope you guys were able to make it. Did you all see the keynote this morning? Yeah. What did you think of that the keynote? keynote? That was excellent. Right. Any themes that kind of you know stuck with you? Any any interesting uh, dynamics? I, I like that whole concept of if you want to see what your customers are going to be like, you look at your kids today because mm -hmm. that's so true, right? Yeah. Especially if you're building any products that face consumers, those are the, those are your those are your end users. Those are your customers, right? So one of the things that I was thinking is when you apply that to government, what are your what, what are the trends that you're seeing in your agencies or your customers? that you, you say, you know what, agencies should really wake up and do something about this thing because otherwise this trend is going to surpass them. Like, well, what do you see? We've been like, talking about open systems for a while, we're talking about agile, we're talking about, like, what is the real, like, something, a technology trend or a management trend that you see that, you know what, CIOs really have to get schooled on this because this is going to otherwise take us over. So, Steve, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, let me, uh, 
Let me respond in a couple different ways, and part of this is to provoke conversation on purpose, and then I'm going to uh, pass it to uh, Richard because I'm sure he'll add an awful lot to, to what I don't think about. Um, all right, so think about that in terms of the three domains that we often use to talk about a lot of what we do, people, process, and technology. The people challenge that I think we certainly face in the Department of Commerce, and I believe it's broadly true across the federal environment, is a generational one. Meaning, not, so, not just the transition from baby boomers. I'm a baby boomer, and as my daughters remind me, I have four daughters, and they now remind me on a pretty much daily basis, Dad, you've become a curmudgeon. <laughs> Unfortunately, they might be right. Okay. But very shortly, we're going to have four generations in the workplace at the same time. I don't know the last time historically that's actually occurred. Maybe, maybe some of you guys might. But that creates a very, very significant challenge. If I use commerce as a real example, our own office, and I do want to, uh, since this is interactive, I may even call on a couple colleagues sitting at the back table. They think they're <laughs> hiding. Isella, Isella Dornell is our deputy CIO at the Department of Commerce. Rod Turk was formerly our CISO. Rod is now the CISO at the Department of Energy. So they've lived and breathed this. Uh, Isella with me now, Rod before he moved to energy. Um, when I walked in the door, we had 25 vacancies out of 75 positions, okay? So hiring and recruiting talent is big challenge number one. Big challenge number two, retaining that talent. We're losing people, particularly our cyber skills. <laughs> They're either being stolen away by Rod, uh, <laughs> or, or we're, we're competing not only with you know, the Department of Commerce itself with our bureaus, but we're competing with every other federal agency and we're competing with the private sector. We are not gonna win that battle from a compensation, workplace environment, stuff like that. So that's big challenge number one, skill sets, people, multi-generations. On the process side, I'm gonna skip it. I'm, I'm getting tired, it's just my brain. I, I just don't have that much interest in something like this and talking a whole lot about process unless you guys want to go there. Then I'm happy to do it. So I'm going to jump real quick to technology. Let me give you a fun little real, almost real-time example. So I jumped off the plane last night. I thought about driving down here, but by the time everything was done, it was 9.30, 10 o'clock, I said, hey, I'm driving in the morning. I called Jake. I said, hey, I'll see you in the morning. So I headed out, fortunately, early. I left about quarter to six. Normally, I'm not an early person. I'm on the road, I get over the bridge, I borrowed my third daughter's, we have four, third daughter's 2003 Hyundai Santa Fe, which is the vehicle that got the first three daughters through college. <laughs> so 186,000 miles on it, it's still running, as far as Chester, Maryland. <laughs> the thing overheated, I pulled off the road, okay? And this is about, I don't know, seven, seven o'clock, right? So what would you do and what do I do? Technology, right? Grabbed my iPad, Googled where I was, and then just started a quick search. Where's an auto repair and where's some car rental? Somebody is smiling on me, less than a mile away, sitting side by side, sharing the same parking lot, Enterprise Car Rental and Western Auto Car Care. <laughs> no lie. And a couple of the managers walked in early. They don't open till eight o'clock. I explain the situation, you know, one, to fix the car, take a look at it or whatever, great, left that, ran over to Enterprise. Enterprise had no cars, but I'm looking and I said, what about that thing? So if you look out in the car's parking center, all the way at the end, you'll see a cargo van. <laughs> <laughs> With Enterprise car rental on the side. Oh, the that's point awesome. being, there's no way in the world that I could have pulled that off without the technology that we have and take for granted today. Now it's a fun example and it's a real example, but now carry it into the workplace. The biggest challenge that Izella and myself, and we're trying to figure out in commerce, Richard faced it in his government role. Now he's, now he's kind of tackling it to both help us in government and in the private sector. How do we bring that same technology, the simple quick use, into the federal environment? 
We are not doing it. The technology that we've got in the Department of Commerce is from about the 19th century. And it sounds like, well, isn't that what we're in? No. We're trying to get into the 21st century. All right. So let me pause there. We'll kind of create the conversation. Richard, take it away. Well, well thanks for that, Stephen. And, and by the way, a great segue, because I was going to pick up on that theme. Um, you know, I served at the IRS and I served at DHS and uh, wonderful, you know, I will love my uh, time in government and, and uh, wonderful people, dedicated people, as good as anywhere, by the way, because I think on the people side, you know, there are certainly issues, but um, I was going to say government workers as dedicated and capable as, as any, anybody. That being said, I think it's the system. Right, the system, the the way the everything from our procurement system to um, the way that uh, the the, uh, the management structures have, have been uh, built over years in these departments and agencies, um, the way in which um, then the the money flows to those different organizations, it it really has caused this set of dynamics that while work for general government okay, don't help necessarily to optimize to get us the best IT solutions, right? And to your point, Sonny, this question of, well, you know, what are we missing or what, what are those trends? I mean, I think they're, we're all technologists, right? So we're all using the tools of the trade in our own experiences, yet in government, many times we felt handcuffed, right, like Steve does, because it's so difficult to bring in these new technologies. And, and, and to be able to deploy them effectively and to be able to secure them properly, um, given where we're at. And so I, I do believe that, you know, this, and we're not here to talk about um, all, everything that's going in and around Fatara necessarily, but you know, there's this hope that says, hey, if we can, we, we can kind of break the model a bit, okay, on how we manage IT and government, we have this chance to potentially really move the ball forward a lot. And I, I really hope, and I've got a lot of optimism right now, that we've got this opportunity to actually change the game a bit right now. And I'm, I'm really hoping we seize that. And so one example that's tangible about this is I've just been a huge believer that way too many of the people um, in government IT are, are, are uh, if you will, having to take care of a bunch of leg legacy systems that have been built over years and even decades and, and the like. Um, and that is, if you will, that seed corn, you know, we eat our own seed corn. We, we can't invest enough in the new because we're always having to take care of the old. And so this notion of being able to, at least on the IT infrastructure, and I want to be careful here because you know, people I, you, you oversimplify this and say, well, IT infrastructure is commodity and therefore you just, you know, you just, you know, outsource that and then you get everybody to focus on the, the higher value, so quote higher value and be careful with that statement too, but mm -hmm. focus on things that are closer to perhaps the customer, right, and these technologies. And I want to be careful with that statement because there's a tremendous amount of innovation going on in, quote, the infrastructure layer, right, as well. But that being said, I think, I think what we need to do in government is we need to rely more on the vendor community, right, in different kinds of ways to take more of that on, okay, and continually innovate there and upgrade there while we get more of the IT professionals in government partnering better with our business clients, our mission and business clients in order to drive more value for them. Because ultimately, IT here isn't just for its own sake, but it's here to help the mission and business of government. And so I think what's happened, to your point, Steve, is we've, over time, we, we can't move fast enough because we, we, we have this albatross of that legacy around their neck. We're focused so much on just keeping the lights on, so to speak, it makes it much more difficult to bring in the newer technologies. Hence what happens is, except in pockets, and you always have some pockets, and in fact, there's even areas where the government leads, right, in innovation and technology. But generally in government, we, we lag behind because of those dynamics. And, and I'm hoping that with Fatara and with some of the things that, that they're looking to do coming out of OMB with Hill Guidance, if we can try to break that model put in a more modern a management model for IT, we have a chance to at least to start to catch up. So, so with that, I'll, I'll leave that on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of start to sort of like uh, 
go into our new hackathon model, right? So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose the question, pose a question to the room. I want you guys to think about it for about two minutes. It's not a very difficult question. So just in your own experience, think about it for two minutes and confirm with your other colleagues on the table. And uh, you know, bo and both of these gentlemen will provide their perspective. And then I want we want us to kind of report out. I want us to kind of share what your thoughts are for each table. And then what we'll try to do is, at the end of the session, try to sort of get some common themes around what drives those kinds of things. So the question I'm going to ask you is, in your career, think back to two things. A really successful initiative you were a part of. Either you led it, you were part of a team, you were, you, were, you, were, you were engaged. It doesn't have to be an IT initiative. It could be an IT initiative. It could be a system implementation project, if you will. But it could be a change management initiative of any kind, organizational change. Uh, or, or something that you were so proud of and you look back today that yes, we did it. And it was difficult and we pulled through. And also I want you to think of a one initiative that you, you, you don't look back fondly on. <laughs> and I think all of us have had one of those, right? <laughs> if we haven't, then we haven't pushed hard enough. Because uh, if you don't have those experiences, when you look back and you're like, you know, that was an absolute disaster. And I, I, I just couldn't see it at the time, but man, looking back at it, it was just the wrong thing to do at the wrong time. And what I want you to do is, for each one of these examples in your mind, I want you to come up with three key factors that you think contributed to either the success or the failure of that initiative. So if you think of uh, something that you were uh, that you were part of that was really successful, think of team management challenges, management traits, leadership traits, or other factors that you think outside of you, just don't say, I was awesome, I was great, I was the best guy. So. Uh, but outside of you that, that conspired to make that a huge success or a less than successful initiative. So why don't you guys take five minutes, talk to the people in the team, because what we want to do is to identify sort of the aggregate, the average of those factors so we can take something home and maybe sort of start pulling those threads. And then we'll also see is if there's those things that emerge out of the room have a good overlap around Fatara and contemporary practices and management and see if we can sort of take some of these lessons home. Sound good? Any questions? Let's, let's get started. So we'll give you guys five minutes. In the meantime, while you guys are conferring, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more. So, <laughs> it says it's on. Yeah. All right. So you had quite an adventure coming in. Yeah. <laughs> you must really want to be here. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you for being here. Yes. <laughs> And this band is funny. One of the applications I was uh, responsible for the development of many development boards. I was given the environment about maybe 16% of the way down. I can't help it. And we're getting ready to. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. <laughs> and you're gonna pay them. You gotta pay them. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Well, I think I was. I was actually thinking about it during the keynote, and when you said this, I mean, it's exactly true. Like more and more, and it's not just a technology endorsement, but I mean. The natural reaction now, I think all of us have been trained now that when we need something, we reach for our phone. That's the first thing you reach to, right? Let me look something up, let me call somebody, let me do something. But it's all on the phone. Yeah. Yes, it's an evolutionary thing rather than, but it's not, yeah. 
Right, right. I haven't bought it. I mean, I, I was thinking about it. I was like, I haven't bought a CD in, you know, 10 years now, less than 10. But I mean, it's been a long time. And I was like, I don't really feel the need anymore because you have so many options between Amazon and iTunes and everything. But it used to be a whole thing, right? You go to the mall, you go to the CD store, you buy music, you browse it, and all of that is gone. Yeah. Publishing, record stores, uh, it's, it's amazing. I mean, then I was thinking about it, so I went to San Francisco a couple weeks ago. And my entire, not intentionally, not like trying to force myself, by my entire experience of booking the flight, booking the hotel, checking into the airport, checking into the flight, boarding card, getting to the hotel on the other side, was done on my cell phone. I went to the Travelocity app, got a great deal, went to the hotel, had the boarding pass on the phone. And I didn't realize until after, I was like, holy crap, I never had to fax anything, print anything, call anybody. And if it was a government process, I would have to call, fill out forms, send somebody, wait for them to call back. It would have been like completely a different experience, right? Yeah, yeah, if, if you can think about that, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And then we'll take some notes and see where, see where everybody shakes up. Hey, can you, um, when the tables report out, can you, oh, oh. Could you uh, just like capture them, like, and then maybe we can do a report out in the end and see if there's any themes or whatever. Well, so are you guys a six plus? It's. <laughs> But I mean, like, another point that guy made was like, you know, what? How are we getting dependent on technology so much that we can't untether? And that this is one way. It's like now, if like the phone is dead, you are so lost. You're like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, the power, the battery and power. You know, that's the next wave of it. I think disruption that needs to happen is much, much better batteries. Like you know. That's, um, yeah, because I mean, the phones don't last anymore. I mean, my phone, I mean, it doesn't last me a whole day anymore. If it does, it's a lucky day. And is it, is it, yeah? That's, right, yeah. Wow. Wow, two hour call. That's that's great. That's awesome. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. Really? Yeah. <laughs> no, no wonder. <laughs> no, but it's, it's right, right. I mean, and one of the things that the guy made, which really resonated, is that whole concept of simplicity, right? Simplicity is how you drive culture change. Intuitive simplicity, right? And if you think of any great product that really takes off, like all of it kind of goes viral, it's got to be simple. It's got to be a one-sentence tagline. You know, it can't be a yeah. Yeah, it can't be a huge strategic plan that people are like, I don't know what this yeah, is, oh, we're going to have a... But like every single system we build in government is like starts complex and gets ends up more complex. Add more screens and tabs and this and, and it just drives people batty. Yeah, but I mean, think about the tax, think about filing your taxes as as regulated a process as you can get. But somehow TurboTax has made it so that an average grandma can do it. Yeah, to open up the... It was absolutely the right decision. But I was thinking, like, the point I'm trying to make is, if, if you imagine the IRS has designed a user experience, you think it would look like TurboTax? Not in a million years it would look like a TurboTax, right? So yes, it's complex, but if you can sort of make that process fairly simple, you should be able to make the process of registering to do business in SAM equally simple. It's not that hard, but we just screw it up because we don't open it up, we don't open exposed APIs. Yeah, that's the government. We think we can do it.
technology yeah. and then try to back into We should we should get stop building systems and start building APIs. Just build APIs first. Yeah. That's 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 a huge and that's a difficult thing for people to understand, but you expose it, you educate people on how to use it and then let them go. All right, let's bring these guys in. All right, guys, I think our five minutes are coming to an to close. Let's uh, let's let everybody let's let's let's. This is actually great. You guys are actually talking. It's an engaged group. We're actually great here. We can just talk about random cards. Okay, guys. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Fun stuff. We'll give you more time at the end to finish up your conversations. But what I don't want to do, do want to do is to do some report outs. Uh, one of your, each one of your tables, if you could identify somebody with the best voice that you can project. Uh, would love to, what we'd love to do is to sort of hear from you the three trends for successful, unsuccessful uh, initiatives. We'll capture those. And what I'd like to do is, to, and then obviously hear from our experts, overlay them, and see if there's themes, right? And then we also want to bump those themes against Vitara, some of the more contemporary things going on in, in Congress and, and OMB, and see if something makes sense, or if something is completely out of, out of sync with where uh, policymakers and lawmakers are going, and where your experience has shown you best practices uh, belong, right? And then hopefully we'll take out, we'll take away like a best practice sheet with us so that we can remember, you know, the kinds of things we need to do as leaders when we get back to organization. So let's start with the table in the far back. Azela, you wanna you wanna take kick us off? Well, you know, as as being with your uh college I would like to first with my college. <laughs> 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 I have a lot of talking, so I think I need to listen. Okay. And I, mean, I didn't even mention that we have these wonderful flip charts that are beautiful and completely pristine still. So you could have used them, but uh, if you haven't, and that's fine. Uh, let's, just, let's just see if you guys can report out. So who would like to report out from that table? You want to do it? So one of the things, I can talk loud. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that we were talking about was there's actually twofold. It's having the executive buy-in and the visibility for the overall organization rather than the pockets going after just uh, a uh, efficiency for their particular job, okay. not for the organization. So instead of like, so big thinking versus little thinking. So think, instead of thinking about your particular silo, thinking about the larger organization's objectives and goals and championing those. And having executive buy-in at that level. At that level, okay. And that, that is something that, that you think was a factor in successful uh, what about the converse? What was something that was always there every time you had a bad experience with a project? The same thing of bureaucracy is one of the key issues. Okay. There's too much opportunity to say we can't do that because we have to do all of these and follow these guidelines, these policies. So a lot of no saying, a lot of a uh, lot of doubt, and a lot of uh, just not not buy-in from a lot of stakeholders. It's the bureaucracy portion. The bureaucracy, okay. Okay. The guidelines have to be followed, which sometimes slow the process. Okay. All right, let's go to the next table. See if you guys can add, add more to that. So we had some similar responses as well around the engagement with leadership and across. Um, another key thing that came up in our discussion was I would, I would turn an umbrella over to mitigating risk. And the specific things that came up were things like being comfortable yeah. and having a structured process to identify problems and you know things that were going to go wrong as soon as possible and address it. And okay. Not hiding them or you know waiting, hoping to go away. So like an early warning system exactly. or like just you know, so did that go towards communication or, or go towards systems and processes? Uh, Capture them. Yeah. It's about not only identifying mm. technology related issues but also things about you know, engaging the right stakeholders. That is also identify key issues. You've okay. got the right people around the table that are saying, hey, you think this is great, but from my pocket, everyone's going to hate it, and they won't use it as what have you. So you can identify all kinds of potential risks and mitigate them ahead of time by doing that technology. Okay. So uh, let's, let's pull on that side a little bit. So you say, so both of you have said uh, leadership buy-in. What does that look like? What are the qualities that go deeper, one level deeper? Think of the best leader that you've ever worked with, whether it was you or somebody that you worked for or worked with uh, that has been part of that initiative. What are those qualities of that leader? What does that look like? I mean, if somebody walks in a room and say, you have buy-in and walks out, is that a great leader? Or are there deeper sort of qualities and traits that uh, 
that, that you think are relevant there? I think the leader does a good job of linking uh, the initiative to the agency mission or the vision. Okay, good. So okay. that people can align to it. They understand uh, exactly what, why it's important and how it is linked to that mission. So people care about why what they're doing is important and how it links to the bigger bigger goal. So that's a, that's that 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 to me is extremely important point, right? Because however you do it, whether you're in a startup environment or a government agency, a large or small company, if you can create that culture where people buy into what they're doing and why they're doing it, and if you communicate that, if you through traditional communications, through culture, through whatever, that seems to be a good theme to kind of get people engaged around common common initiatives, right? Why, why does the open source community, which has over 1.8 million developers across the world, but no CEO and no leader, care so passionately about writing open source software? Why do they do it? Because they care deeply about the, what they're doing. They know why, they have this vision, they look at themselves as evangelists, we're making a difference, right? And they put their own time weekends, nights in their parents' basements, usually, um, to, to, to make that better, right? Without a leader, without a manager, without a director, without a SVP, without a SES, they still get it done, right? So that's, that's a good point. Let's go to the next table. Any other thoughts or traits you can identify? Yeah, I think, you know, we came back to the same conclusion, too, that leadership is a strong uh, portion of that. However, you know, Having the buy-in is very important, but then also having the visionary. Having somebody that has that idea is really crucial for that as well. If somebody stands up and is not afraid to say, we need to do something different. We need to go a different direction. Um, so and, some of the vision. Yeah, but that person needs to be persistent with that. You know, there's fine right. line between being persistent and stuff. Right. right. So Does that person have to be the same person who is the quote-unquote leader? No. So you need an ideas guy, and you need the leader guy, yeah, and how do you define those two roles? So, what are what is the leader? What, what what are the three things that the leader must do? Not like personality traits, but like in my view, it's like the leader must be able to approve the budget, hire the people, set priorities, and the vision person. Their traits are different, but I may be wrong. So, what are your thoughts it around? Be, it could be vision for people, right? If the leader needs to be able to listen to all the visions. Okay. Choose the one that's going to be the one that they're going to put their uh, way behind and say we need to go and do that. Um, so the leader is more collaborative, they're yeah, listening, yeah. they're connecting, they're empowering people. Yeah, what I find is uh, the thing that we don't succeed is when the leader is, you know, Oh, okay. Well, that's leader, good. What do you guys think about that? Hmm. I'm stubborn. Richard, what do, you, what, do you, what do you think about that? That's actually I don't, a very good I don't, I don't necessarily agree that it has to be different people, but you, you have to have a shared vision over time, right, to bring a team along. And that has to be a vision that ties back to something that's demonstrably going to help that, that agency succeed. So I would agree with all of that. I, I'm not so sure that it's, it's got to be different individuals. No. It can be one, but, but, but the team is important, right, absolutely. So let's explore that just a little bit more, and you know, again, your table or others who prefer to jump in, please. This is not a this is not a moderated session like you think it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, but th think about it this way: so you said that there's got to be vision, and the vision can be established by someone; doesn't have to be the leader. There's also this need for a leader who can inspire and manage and listen and direct actions, etc. So if 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 in this situation where the person who's setting the vision, coming up with an idea, is different than the person who's actually have the responsibility, the authority, and the ability to execute it. How do you create an environment where those ideas don't get quashed before they even start? Right? And, and have you ever worked in an environment where bringing an idea legitimately to somebody's attention in a way that can be done something with it is hard because it's not, the environment doesn't allow for open listening and open consideration of those ideas. Has anybody ever worked in an environment like that? Mm -hmm. So, of course. <laughs> just a couple of you, really. The rest of you must work at Google or Facebook or something. Um, so, like, uh, if you have, what are like? How do you how do you plan? Like, how do you how do you propose changing that? What do you, what are the traits in that environment that allow for that ideation to grow? And how does that ideation become real? Versus, what are the traits that kill that idea before it even leaves your mouth? Yeah, well, you know, the, the, vision, the vision is important, but in order to then follow through with that, there has to be some alignment 
throughout the organization of uh, how you measure how you measure value or mm -hmm. success. So if, if 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 I've got an idea, my the, my first line manager is evaluating me on a certain set of metrics, mm -hmm. right? You know, say focused on the operation. But I've got this new idea that's going to fundamentally change everything. I'm hearing from the senior leader that that's what they're looking for. I've got this layer in the middle that's disincentivizing me to bring that idea forward. Mm -hmm. Because if I start spending my time trying to pursue that idea, now I'm doing something that's not aligned with my day job. Right. And how I'm being evaluated. So you've got to have this, 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 this ripple effect throughout the organization where you measure the behavior you're looking for. So let me, let me fill that. The, the you're, you're exactly right. So let's flip this for a second. Think of one, you, you know, we all have careers, we've worked in a few different places in our careers, right? Think of the one time you worked in a team or an organization or a company or an agency where it was the exact opposite of that. Where people thrived on not only sharing ideas but listening to those ideas and they actually generated business outcomes. Any examples of those? Yeah, well, I've actually been involved in several organizations like that, and I find that, you know, this is going to sound silly, it's not exactly true, but just sort of when you take the management out of the situation, it tends to improve that kind of thing. Yeah. Management you out. Need to set, you need to set the expectation. You need to create the big envelope. But then if you allow the team to figure out how to make that happen, mm -hmm. and then you reward them collectively, on the success of their achievements, then you get a lot more team building activity going on. It's a great idea. I, I, I pick up on this idea, and I've sold this too much in government, my, my, my view. There's a hierarchical kind of view. Uh, too much in government. So a lot of times the best ideas are by the individuals that are very, very close working to a problem, right? And they may, you know, they may be engineers or analysts or, you know, they'll have a management role per se. And what I found too much coming in as like a CIO is you get into these meetings and they may be in the corner of the room, right? But they're never talking, right? It's only the quote management or the SCS even that are talking. And you know, I tried to break that down because I always thought that was not the best model when you're trying to actually get to the best solution, right? And you're trying to get these ideas generated and trying to get free flowing. But, but there is this fear factor, I think, and Jim was alluding to, you, if, if you're working for someone and they're not open to that, then it, it causes a set of issues. And yeah. so I think in government we need to work on this issue of, it's one thing to have a management hierarchy, but good ideas can come from everywhere, yeah. right, and every, everyone. And you've got to foster an environment that people feel safe to be able to throw out those ideas. So, and, and you know, uh, this is not a trick question because people, organizations large and small, have been trying to tackle this problem for decades, right? I mean, remember, there used to be an idea box model. Yeah. Where you have an idea box on the wall, yeah. just drop your idea, it's got to be anonymous. Did that ever work? Uh, I yeah, think it might have worked a couple of times. Yeah, we actually, there, there are real examples in government of that kind of the modern day, you know, idea suggestion box type thing. Um, TSA had one of the, Transportation Security Administration, had one of the earlier uh, attempts at that. And it's actually, it's still running. Mm -hmm. um, it, they label it idea, idea Hub. Right. was, uh, was mm -hmm. TSA's. Um, the FAA has an instantiation, very similar type of thing, uh, the idea factory. Um, the Department of Commerce recently launched a very similar type of thing. And what's interesting and intriguing about all three, those are the three that I happen to be the most aware of and knowledgeable and have kind of talked or been involved. Um, the, the generation of ideas is significant. In other words, all three of those generated a ton of ideas almost immediately, okay? With discussion threads and people building upon previous ideas and suggestions and that type of thing. What's interesting is to watch how process, even inside what I think all of us would view as, well, that's innovation. Well, process inside innovation kind of slows down what comes out the other end of the funnel, so to speak. Right. Okay? And I don't have an immediate answer. Okay? We'll, we'll keep you abreast of, of how we do in commerce. But we consciously, in setting up the mechanism in commerce, attempted to make the process as intuitive, as straightforward, as simple, which is which Richard and I and Sonny were talking about quietly up here while you guys were, were working among your tables. Because if you think about the lesson learned from 
take your pick. But let's use the iPhone. When the iPhone was first introduced, anybody get an instruction manual with your iPhone? Okay? If it isn't simple and intuitive, today, nobody uses it. We've got to figure out a way to carry that model, simple, intuitive, and I can pick it up and use it. Whatever it is, I believe has to be a lesson we carry into innovation and whatever we're up to in the federal environment. Mm -hmm. That's the three of us so we're talking great, about It's that. a great con. So is, yeah. does that resonate with people? So think again back to products, projects that you've been part of that were successful or not successful. Does complexity and simplicity play a role there? Is there an angle to when things are simple, easily understandable, you're trying to do one thing, one thing really well, that it's more likely to succeed versus you're doing 89 pages worth of features with 14 different mm -hmm. stakeholder groups, which is again, some things that may not always be in your control, but. Well, you bring up a really good point, the simplification and how often, so from the industry perspective, do we see over-prescriptive requirements mm -hmm. coming from, right? But, so there's no innovation going into a solution because, you know, you've already attempted right. to define what the solution has to be. So, you know, this simplified is absolutely, I think, key to overcoming some of those challenges. All right, so let me, let me take a, a, a shot here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in on purpose. And I'm gonna probably say something in the next minute that's going to piss off people in this room. <laughs> and if not, then I haven't succeeded at what I'm trying to do. <laughs> but, but Rich, I mean, several of us in the room who have been in government have lived this, all right? Okay, so here's, I think, a significant challenge that Tony is alluding to that we've got to figure out another way to come at it. All right. If I, in government, want to come out with what most of us would think of as a statement of objectives rather than a statement of work. Statements of work tend to be, unfortunately, my, that's my parenthetical expression for purposes in here today, unfortunately, very prescriptive and proscriptive. A statement of objectives is much more wide open so that vendors have the ability, look, here's our problem. You guys tell us how you do it. But here's the rub. It's very difficult to collaborate with our acquisition professionals because, now bear with me, because I'm headed, I'm giving you full warning. Those of you in the industry, I'm about to piss you off. They are very concerned about how we do the evaluation of very different responses because otherwise industry, and here it comes, you guys are going to protest. And when you protest, it disrupts everything. All right? It's a pain in the ass to those of us in government when you guys protest. I'm not telling you don't I'm protest. I'm going to tweet that right now. <laughs> <laughs> right? So if you quote me, please quote me in context. So you see now what I'm driving at. In other words, somehow we've got to figure out industry in partnership with government. How do we get past this? Because our acquisition professionals are not the bad guys. And neither is industry. Yeah, none of us in government like it when you guys protest. But honestly, nobody is trying to be a bad guy. So how do we work through this situation where we can give industry wide open opportunity. Guys, give us two or three different ways you'd solve this. Help us figure out how do we then evaluate those very different responses so that in turn, if one of yours is not selected, you don't protest. I don't have the answer. But that's a little bit of, I think, what's tied up in this. Yeah. Now, if you disagree, fire away at me. Okay, but if you agree, how do we start to kind of fix or address this in some positive way? And again, look, no, no bad guys in this. Okay, I, I understand that. Let me ask you this question. Actually, that's a really good point. But let's, let me flip this again to the industry. So who is from industry in this room? Um, <laughs> Depending on your role, and I don't know who, you, I mean, who your roles are, but you're running your company, you're a significant part of your company. How do you use technology in your company? How do you select technology in your company? How do we select it? Yeah. Well, we don't have the same rigor from an evaluation model. 
perspective. How do you so do it? Everybody comes in, they present their different technology, okay. and we make a determination based on what we think meets our, our business objectives. Okay, perfect. Sounds completely logical and <laughs> completely commonsensical. Why can't we do that in government? Because, uh, no, I, mean, I, I know all the reasons why, let's not yeah. go into those, but how is it that you can do that, but it's not okay for a government agency to do it because the other three people are going to protest? Why can't the government agency make a decision on what's the best business decision for them? I think you have to look at the why mm -hmm. somebody protests. Right? And so somebody protests because they believe that someone else So, but I want to flip away from acquisition because that's actually said excellence. Yeah, and that's yeah. a different conference altogether. <laughs> it's, no, actually, yeah, it no, no conversation fault. in IT about IT and government can happen without a thorough mm -hmm. discussion of acquisition. My concern is that that's, that's you, all you end up talking about, right? So we understand the problems and opportunities. You had a comment, sir, unless it was about acquisition. That's right. <laughs> Sonny, Sonny, the, the, um, not every time, but in choice times. Things work when leaders get get more engaged. Oh, okay. They can't do it all okay. the time. That's that's good. Because if they if they dive too deep on a project or or, or, or an in initiative, the other stuff. Gets, so so gets you forgotten. you two should talk to each so other because that gentleman just said leaders should just get out of the room and let the teams work, and you're saying they should be more engaged. How, like, how do you define engagement? And, 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 well, there's, 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 there's a difference between leadership and management. Right. Right. Yeah, I'm not trying to get the managers out of the Man Oh, okay. So the leaders can stay. The managers leave. So the, the leaders and the practitioners should work together to make it work. And the managers should just okay. manage spreadsheets outside the room. <laughs> good idea. But you take some good idea. Um, it's, it works best when you make the, that person with the idea, the leadership of taking that, that idea. Because so often... A manager will get involved and alter the vision and and the yeah. enthusiasm for carrying it out when that person who came up with the idea sees sees his or her vision going off the course. Sonny, can I yeah, can I please, jump please, in? Please. So uh, can we go back to your original question? Because I'd like to try to answer sure, it please, from yeah. my perspective. Because uh, I and I'm gonna do the flip side, the three things. And actually, if it's done well, projects go great. And my, what I've seen, and if it's not done well, they, don't, they go horribly, right? And so the first one, it was talked about, it's, it's really, in my mind, and particularly in government, it's about alignment, okay, inside government. You, you, if you, there's a bunch of stakeholders, for those of us that have been in government, and if you don't have all your stakeholders aligned and part of the process, believe me, it causes big problems. I mean, because people will come out of the woodworks if they're not part of it, and they will kill things, and they will hurt you. Um, so there's this alignment issue around that, and it's a constant thing. It's not a one-time like, okay, we're all going to do this program, and boo, we got everybody aligned the first time. You know, you, you got to have some kind of governance model that brings people together on some regular basis to keep keep this dialogue going. Because issues will come up, requirements will change, all kinds of things happen, and you got to you got to have the right stakeholders in the room. 
That's number one that I think is absolutely key. Number two is just a, is a talent issue. Too often government programs, and if you guys are on the industry side, you, you know it, right? I mean, sometimes you walk into these contracts you're, you get and you go, oh my God, we are in trouble now, right? Because you know, out of the gate, that government people are not really up for the job sometimes. And that's not against any individual government person, but there's a set of skills you need on the government side to run these things, and sometimes the government moves forward without the right set of skills, and that just happens. And, and so I think that's, the, that's number two. The third thing I see that have been disasters or, or great is if you can get your, and I'm talking about here where we're hiring vendors, and most programs that are doing anything large hire vendors, if you can do it in such a way that you actually have a gelled team and it's not a we versus them uh, kind of environment, you actually have a chance for real success. When I've walked into programs reviewed or been part of them and it turns into a we versus them, it's usually a disaster waiting to happen, yeah. right? So those are three things. I mean, there are other things I could talk about, but those are the three that pop right to the top of my head. And it's, it's their mirror, right? I mean, you either get them right and things go well or you don't, and, and I can guarantee you most of you will have failed. I, mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree personally, certainly, and I also actually want to extend that we versus them further, right? So it's definitely a us versus them between vendor and government employees, but it's also us versus them between IT and non-IT people. Well, that's, right? yes. Ultimately, if the program people who are going to be using the damn thing every day are not part of the conversation throughout the life cycle, you've got to give them something that they didn't ask for and can't care less about. So one of the things that I've seen a lot in my experience at GSA and prior and since is that too often when we're about to buy and make a major decision, we, we tie the value of that decision to this level of seniority somebody needs to be in the room to make that decision, mm -hmm. right? Which is fine because that's how like, you know, hey, you need to get the CIO in the room if you're going to buy a $10 million thing. Get it. But then the CIO should leave the room after they've made the decision about the spending the $10 million and actually get the people in who are actually going to use the damn thing. Because what happens is you get the SESs into the room and say, okay, sir, we're going to build an acquisition system. What are all your requirements? And that SES is never going to log into that acquisition system. Right. Ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but right. they will tell you all the requirements. They will give you, oh, this has to have reports here, and I need to see the... And then when the thing actually releases, the people who are going to be logging in every day and struggling with it, like, who the hell designed this? <laughs> Why? This makes... So that engagement from the end user, the actual user, the actual consumer, it's very important. Actually, I was talking to, um, I had a trip over to UK, and I was talking to people at the Government Digital Service, which is very equivalent to the US Digital Service there, right? And they have this philosophy, which is really resonated with me because who, why wouldn't it? So they said every time we release any product, whether we build a website or solution or a team or ability to register or whatever, if it's a public facing website or a public facing tool or a system, they say, we don't release it, we, we release it to beta. But then we never release it to full production until we bar hop. And I was like, what the hell does that mean? Actually, not bar hops, you know, pub crawl. And like, we'll take it to five pubs and we show, show people in the pubs, would you use this thing? And if they, if they, if they can get it and understand it, <laughs> say, yeah, this is good. Yeah, I'm quite sure, yeah. Well, Maybe we got, we got something. But if they're like, what This is citizen stuff? facing stuff, yeah, right? Yeah. Not DHS stuff. <laughs> yeah. not, not DHS internal things. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, but, but it sort of shows that, that it's the same threat, right? Talk to the people who are going to use the thing. And if they think, if they think this, is, uh, this is not something they need, ultimately, you're there. You're building something so that you can make their lives better. And if they don't get it, then the only impression they're going to have of IT is they spent $10 million and we got this out of it. Yeah. Who the hell thought this was a good idea, right? So yeah. thoughts on that. I mean, it, it, it kind of touches a vision thing and a strategy thing. Go ahead. Yeah, but I think that's a, it's very astute. The, one, the, the whole thing, but one part in particular is when you have the IT department developing a solution based on a set of requirements they got from people mm -hmm. who have no idea how to tell you what the requirements are. Well, yes. And so what you end up with is something that's completely not engaged. I will say that I was fortunate enough to be part of a team that at TSA that made a solution. It was the airport information management solution <coughs> that was built by the, by the users yes. for the users. They involved the users in the entire process. And they started off with something they could actually do, 
develop rapidly, deploy, and then continuously, I think that's another section, continuously <laughs> develop <laughs> to add more and more capabilities as the people were seeing it. It was incredibly successful. So does that sound, sound like sounds like there's some manifesto is about to be released there? Do you wanna do you wanna make like a manifesto statement about how IT should work in the 21st century? The by the people for the people. I like that idea. I'll, 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 I'll write a book. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have to get an outcome here today. We don't have time for your book. Um, no, I think it's a good idea. So thoughts on that? I think, I think having Steve and Richard here is extraordinarily important because both of them have been both in government and out of government. And so the, the, the sensitivity on both sides right. is something that, you know, if you've never been one or the other, you don't get, you know, if you've right. never been in the industry, we're vendors. Right? Sure, we're, we're right. We're just mm. contractors. If you've never been in government, then it's just the government, right? Mm. But when you right. had the opportunity to see both sides, it was even at a grander level, the, the understanding of how each one of us mm. have sensitivities towards what we're supposed yeah. to be doing, to make this country better. I mean, we're all patriots in this room, or we'd all be working for Nintendo. You know, it's not the money, it's the price. Right, right. Uh, it's the fact that we're trying to do something good for the country. Right, right. And, and I think it's, you know, when you have people like Richard and Steve, who've been on both sides, and we can talk to that. Yeah. That's really where you need to They also help us meet our registration goals, so <laughs> that's also <laughs> good. <laughs> no, but you're exactly right. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The sun, Sunny's in that ballpark yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I've, I've only been there once, so you guys, you guys, you guys, you guys can speak about more. I'm sorry. How many protests have you filed? I'm working on my third one right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't filed any protests, and I hope I never have to. But just with all due respect, Sunny, your time with GSA was the epitome of the innovation. You don't have to say all due respect, I'll take it. <laughs> you're, you're complimenting me and you're starting with the tools. That's <laughs> you did take those legacy systems, make new ones quickly, left the legacy systems to just be what they were and then take that money for the maintenance and use it somewhere else. I mean, it was genius. Well, I mean, it's very kind of you to say. I mean, I will say one thing, though. I, you know, thank you very much for calling me a genius. I, I do agree with that, that part of your statement. <laughs> um, but uh, what I will say is that like, every agency has unique problems, right? At GSA, we had opportunities that, frankly, many agencies don't have. We had working capital funds. We had multi-year options. Mm -hmm. we, had, um, we had more flexibility than most agencies uh, experience, right? And also, going back to leadership, you know, to, to be very honest, we had this, 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 this period of leaders between Dan Hegelini and Martha and, uh, uh, since then, uh, you know, Denise, who, are, who understand that IT is a driver to business outcomes, and they really created an environment where we were able to take risks and fail. And yes, we didn't fix everything. You know, you can't, right? But what you have to do is say, what are my top 10 things if I really fix them today? 80% of my people will stop yelling at me, you know, tomorrow, or yell at me less because they're never going to stop yelling at you. Um, and so you, you do that, and you find a great team, and many of them are here today, and I miss them every day. But there's a lot of alignment, that, alignment, right? A lot of things have to align to kind of make that happen. It's not for a lack of that trying or lack of capability or genius that other agencies struggle with similar strategies. It's not for anything except some of those stars haven't aligned right, right and they don't align. And many of the stars are out of your control, right? So that's, that's kind of the takeaway. Unfortunately, we do have only two minutes left in the session. So I want to give an opportunity to Steve and to Richard to kind of share some parting thoughts. And then what I want to do is to take the notes that we've taken today, and I want to share them back with you guys as a as somewhat of a manifesto or best practice document. Because again, our, our goal in this conference this year is to have every session you can take something out of and you can use in your organization. So Richard, you want to go first? Um, sure, well, uh, just a, a couple points to wrap up. I, I'll, I'll circle back to my opening comment and, and why I, I, I liked what you said about alignment, right? I mean, sometimes when you get the agency leadership, and we didn't talk, when that alignment includes up to that level, right? Because if you don't have that support, it's really hard to kind of drive the change we're talking about, right? Um, but once you do, um, I, I think we've got this, this opportunity with Fatara and with, with the outlook of OMB right now and this administration, and what I've said is, you know, this, this administration's winding down, so that's not a good thing in general. But I'm hoping that, you know, Tony and that team 
and, and OMB leadership more generally, and even the administration more generally, takes this as they say, hey, we can build the foundational pieces here over the next year and a half to start to move to better, much better way to manage IT and government. And if they do that and put some things in place, okay, and really start to get that to work, you're not going to see many of the results in the next year and a half, because I think it's a five-year journey. But hopefully, then the next administration, right, if things are starting to work, will pick up on it and take it to the next level. Right. That's certainly my fondest hope technology for how we do this. Political. Technology should be apolitical. It should. It, it should. It's not always, unfortunately, in D.C., but it should be as political. Like the business, yep. the, you know, it doesn't matter for GE, Coca-Cola, Nintendo, GM, Ford. You know, if they're doing smart technology, it doesn't matter which political party those CIOs and leaders. Well, and just one last point on that is it, none of what I just said had anything to do with any particular technology either, yeah. right? It's yeah. not, this is not a technology set of issues. Right. Obviously, you want to use technology, but the point is it's all about the management leadership issues in driving that change. Absolutely. Steve? Okay. In the context of our discussion, let me leave you with two things that I have found run through the common core of all of my successes and things I did not do in my not so successes. They're failures in my mind only when you learn nothing from them. Then they're, then they're really failures. All right, number one, you must be crystal clear on what the outcome is that you are trying to achieve. Now whether you call that a deliverable, whether you call that a shared vision. You can put whatever label you want, whether it's an actual solution. You must be crystal clear. The test of when you're crystal clear, pick three different people who know nothing about what you're doing. Explain to them what you believe constitutes crystal clear. And if all three cannot play it back to you correctly, you are not yet crystal clear. Number two. In anything and everything you do that we would talk about as a project or an initiative or solution delivery or something like that, deliver tangible value, tangible visible value as defined by your customer or stakeholder, not you, in three to six months. I don't care how big the multi-year program is. Three to six month tangible, visible value as defined by your customer or stakeholder. Those are the two things I'll leave you with. Great. Final thoughts from the room? Going once, twice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your participation. Let's thank our <laughs> fearless leaders here. Great conversation. And I hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Let's keep these themes fresh in our minds. Thank you, Steve and Richard. Thank you. Thanks, and thank Jake. you, Sonny, for facilitating. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. So direct